Hello, this is the Reverend Dennis Brunel, Rector of St. Luke's Episcopal Church here in the village of East Hampton, welcoming you to our world premiere exhibit of Sacred Threads, a collection of textiles by Jill Lazarson that she has generously contributed to us to exhibit here at St. Luke's. <laughs> Jill Lasserson. I'm standing in the beautiful church of St. Luke's Episcopal Church in East Hampton, New York, and we just finished up a, um, a, a four-week show of ecclesiastical vestments and liturgical garments from my collection. <laughs> This vestment is called the cope, which is really kappa, cope, it, it's how it derives from the Latin. It really means a cape. It's generally worn at various services, at a pontifical high mass it would be worn, at benediction, during evensong or evening prayer. And this cape, if you, this is a wonderful example from uh, the French in the late 1600s, where you see all of this yellow material actually would have been gold thread. So this would have been totally gold shimmering in the candlelight of a church because they didn't have electric lights like we have today. And so you would have this wonderful sparkle that going on with that. This was probably a deeper red given the fact that it's 400 years old. Uh, and it would, have sh it would have just shimmered in that. And it's and probably weighed about 35 pounds all told when you had the whole vestment finished. Uh, this would have, this is a derivative, this would have been a hood that would have gone over the head, in, depending on if they were riding in the cape or, or whatever. I think the beauty of this particular vestment is, is also to see not only that hood, but that gold would have gone all the way down the, le the sleeves as well. So even when he was processing in, the priest or the bishop was processing in, that gold would have been shimmering all the, all the while. One of the things that Jill has done with this exhibit is she's taken artwork of the period and you'll see something similar to any of the, any of the vestments that she has collected. She'll have a piece of artwork such as that one which will go and show something similar as far as the design of the material given in the context of a mass or the Eucharist or communion service, whichever tradition you might be from, uh, that would give you the aspect of that's kind of what it would have looked like. All ornamentation mainly was in the back of vestments in this period of time because the mass was face, the priest would not be facing the people. So as this mannequin is, this would have been what most people would have seen all the time. So it makes it even more important that the decoration is on the back than on the front. So that way they would see this and this is what would be glittering in the, in the candlelight. <laughs> This is a beautiful piece of Elizabethan embroidery. Um, solid gold threads, which seems remarkable that they would have survived. Um, 15 symbols of, of Christian um, motifs from probably 1550, 1600s. All hand done. And it would have been used probably for an altar frontal, I believe, in the church. We've got the full sun and the half moon, which represents Mary, um, the sun above Mary. She's often um, depicted with the half moon beneath her feet. We, of course, have the wheat, which is the bread. We've got the grapes, which is the life. Um, and we've got, um, oh, the phoenix rising, which is symbolic of death and rising after death. There's a lot of floral motifs, which in the Elizabethan times, many people were not um, uh, literate. They couldn't read. And so everything was symbolic. Um, everything meant something, especially the pinks. 
the art that we have um, found for this piece is the Madonna of the Pinks by Raphael. And it's uh, baby Jesus holding the pinks. And the pinks symbolize uh, Mary because uh, during his crucifixion, she, legend has it that she was crying. And where she was crying, um, pinks or carnations, as we call them, rose. Riu, riu, tiu, la guarda di bella, ciò sguardo e lo bode nuestra cordella, ciò sguardo e lo bode nuestra cordella. Riu, riu, tiu, la guarda di bella, ciò sguardo e lo bode nuestra cordella. These are what we call Doge's buttons. And I have had these in my collection for quite a while without really knowing what they were. Um, and so you look at a piece of art, like this beautiful piece here, which a lot of people I'm sure could recognize this as uh, the Doge Leonardo Loredan um, um, by Giovanni Bellini. And you can look at that painting and not notice the buttons so much, but when you have these, then suddenly, oh, that might be what I have. And then I started doing research on these, and I noticed that these have little coral um, beads at the base or the end of them, and it was thought um, to um, ward away evil spirits. And uh, up until the 1600s, um, they didn't start using the metal threads on the Campidonori balls until uh, the 1500s to the 1600s that helped me date these, because prior to that, they were wax. And that's how they voted for the Doge, <clears throat> 11 balls. And we have 11 balls here, and that's what they wore in front of their um, their garment. And the doge wasn't necessarily a holy man, but he had holy rights, and he was respected. He was above the clergy in Venice. And um, these do have an Ottoman influence to them, and Venice had a lot of Ottoman influence. I think there could be some style going on there, too. But they would um, all vote with a piece of parchment inside, and they would break it open, and they would determine who the next doge would be. The doges are only in Venice. The doge could never leave the palace, only when he had to leave. Um, so he literally never left the palace, and it was a lifelong position. So from the early 1300s, possibly late 1200s, but I'm going to call it 1300s. It's difficult to determine. But I do believe this is a cloth of silver. Uh, and for Latin, they would call it diasporum. And only kings could wear diasporum, or highest people um, in the church. And this is woven with real silver threads. You can see here, it really is shiny on this side, but it's had some wear and tear. Um, on this, we have a palmette star and the hexagon, and um, the star in, um, um, in Asia, in the Moorish Spain, it was, it was, uh, it would scare uh, evil away, like the evil eye that you hear about in Turkey and Istanbul. And um, in this time period, there was such a um, merging of the Eastern cultures with the Western cultures, especially through Venice, that um, the symbolism just was blurred. It didn't really become, like if you've got Mary wearing diasporum, here you've got the hexagon and the star, very similar fabric, and it didn't matter. Oftentimes I'd have Cufic, um, which is a uh, Middle Eastern script, had nothing to do with Christianity, but it was, it was so valuable that that's what they would wear. This, this piece is most precious to me. It's, it's very rare. I've been to so many museums looking for items like this, and I, 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 re I rarely find them. And I had a friend of mine who's an expert help me determine that this is what it is, and he said it is. And it was the largest piece he's ever found. And I found this at an auction um, when a museum was deassessing some of their items. <laughs> This was called the chasuble. A chasuble is something that the priest would have worn specifically at the altar during Mass or the Holy Communion service. It really is a descendant of the old uh, Roman senator's uh, outfit that they would have worn. So it's for me, what's always fascinating costume-wise or vestment-wise is how conservative the church really has been. So something like this, which would have been worn by the Roman senators pre-Christian, 
it's still a garment that still exists even today. This is something that I could easily wear here in our church uh, for our regular Sunday services. This is really the first glimpse that we get of liturgical colors that go with the season. Generally, after Pentecost, green, which is a symbol of growth, which is a symbol of hope, uh, is, is what's worn. So you have green here. But note, there's a lot of gold in this as well, which would have upped the value of this cloth automatically. Uh, you have wonderful symbols in here. You have pomegranates. Pomegranate was a primary symbol of the divinity uh, because the little pomegranate uh, fruit inside is always red, symbolizing Jesus' blood being shed. And it was something that you would offer for everyone as he offered his life for us. So we would take this and offer it to others as a symbol of welcome, that Jesus' blood protects us all. So that would be a, a great symbol. On this chasuble, you'll also have the center panel, which is called an Ophrey, O-P-H-R-E-Y, uh, just so that you can win that in a spelling bee somewhere. In the Ophrey, it was, again, a banding that would probably catch the seam of two pieces of this material being put together. So it would cover that seam. Always ornate. Again, here in the yellow would probably all have been real gold thread. Um, yes, they would take gold, they'd pound it down, and they'd pull it out and pull it out until it was usable as thread to be able to sew. So all of these, gold, these light yellow golden areas would have been covered in gold thread. What tends to happen over time, because you can still see some little pieces of gold thread in here, is, is that when the vestment is no longer usable uh, or that another use is being brought forward, you'd see the gold, especially in the medallions. Uh, is that they would take the gold thread out, which is called drizzling. They'd take it out, they'd bring it to the gold uh, person who would then melt it down and then give you that weight in money. Uh, and that would be one of the beauties of this for me is that you have a liturgical, a, pre, a presaging of our liturgical colors today. But you also have three medallions. On the top medallion, you have the Blessed Mother holding the infant Jesus. So more than likely, there was a strong devotion to Mary in this particular church. More than likely, the name of the church is St. Peter because the very center medallion is that of St. Peter. Generally, the patron saint of the church is always in the center. And at the very bottom, you have the resurrection of Christ. You have a little, uh, the Lamb of God, the Agnus Dei, uh, prayers that we say in the service plus a small cross uh, a flag to the side that the lamb is actually carrying, which is a symbol of the resurrection, the triumphant lamb of God that we hear of in the book of Revelation. So they were always want to kind of put the two together, the resurrected lamb. Jesus was the lamb of God who was sacrificed. So it always comes back to bringing all the elements together. So here you have these wonderful, um, wonderful brocade. You have this wonderful needlework that is still, even without the gold, it's just fascinating to see the handwork to really, this is all hand sewn. And each medallion would have been hand embroidered. Um, that's when you'd see in movies like uh, Lion in the Winter or any of those royal uh, things where the queen is up in her chambers with her ladies sewing. This is kind of the stuff that they'd sew as well because it would end up being a gift uh, to the church. En Kerkete de Endestena, Santa Maria, la malle verra por él. La que está de oasis, en paz en Gascoña. This is a dalmatic, a very large dalmatic, and that's a garment that the, um, the, the priest would wear. This is interesting because the, the, the style of this has not changed since the Roman times. This is what the Romans would wear, and it's all split up the side. This piece is very heavy, um, and it's in very aged condition, as you can see, but that's to be expected, as it's 600 years old. Um, this is what they call a cloth of gold, um, and I'm sure you've heard of Henry VIII and the field of cloth of gold. This is what they're talking about. They made the tents out of this fabric. It was, it, it was surreal. Um, um, they borrowed from Westminster Abbey the vestments. Henry did for this. And um, this is real gold, as you can see in here. We've got some damage here, but that's because the gold would cut the silk, because it's very difficult to, as you can imagine, weave silver and gold into cloth without having to do damage. Oftentimes, too, this was drizzled or removed because of its value, and it was sold. 
And um, so it was, it's very rare to find gold remaining in garments of this age. Even in the 18th century, they were moving it. Here we have a pomegranate motif, which again, is you'll find in most Christian art, and it represents um, fertility. We have this plant here called a serpivium, which means ever, um, also strength because it's a succulent, so it, it would um, live forever. And this work down here is called stump work. It's padded with wool. And uh, some people, well, the English call it stump work. Um, other people call it trapunto. Uh, it was just to give it a chiaroscuro, which is that light and dark that the Italians love to do. And um, the red dye that made this cloth um, was oftentimes more valuable than gold, if you can believe that. Um, 600,000 cochineal, Armenian cochineal dried bugs would make one ounce of dye. The artwork up above it, um, this is a painting by Hans Memling, and he was the most sought after court painter. And to put it in perspective, he, for, it would take him three years of painting kings and queens uh, to, to buy three yards of this fabric. This is definitely one of my favorite pieces. It's so rare. There, you, just, you, just, you go to a museum, you might see a fragment of something like this. You'll never find a full garment. And um, it, it's just remarkable that it, it, it's, it's in my collection. It's very rare to find the garments like this because they were buried in their finest. Henry VIII would have a jacket or, or, or a vest made out of this, but it wouldn't be in this condition because he would have worn it a lot. One of the things that I like about this exhibit is that it, it is also showing some household products. You have here two towels that would be from the, the town of Perugia, so hence they're called Perugian towels. In these towels, what is so fascinating is you have this wonderful blue dye, but also you will see in the Gerland Dio Last Supper, you'll see this exact towel design on the tablecloth that Jiren Dio looks uses during his Last Supper in itself. And I find that always an exciting type of thing when you see how the artists of that period take the common things that they would have seen and put it in the context of what they think of as important. So you have, as a tablecloth, this similar design. Or even in this small little crucifixion uh, scene by De Fabriano, you'll see Jesus on the cross, but he also is clothed in one of these towels. Again, you're dealing with something from the 1400s, cloths from the 1400s here, and it's rare that you'll find these. I mean, yes, there's something similar made today in Turkey, but it's not of the same quality. Here you have all hand woven and nice herringbone pattern. You have symbols here on these towels. You have the dragon, which always symbolizes evil, but it's surrounded by the parandin tree, which always symbolizes protection. So we're being protected from evil in this. You have, um, up in the top, you have doves, always a symbol for peace uh, in any, any type of symbology. The, the Middle Ages and the early Renaissance was filled with what they called bestiary theology, theology of animals. How can we take an animal and give it a symbolic meaning? So whenever they would weave things, they would put those types of animals in there, symbolizing, and plants, symbolizing certain aspects. Here you also have the cock crowing at the top. That should be reminding us of St. Peter denying Jesus three times. So that denial can always come about in, in our, our life. That's the symbol of uh, there. You have the unicorn, always a symbol of divinity, always a symbol of something which is infinite. So you have these wonderful symbols that are woven in, used by artists of their day on religious art. Simple hand towels, yet having religious significance based on artwork of the period. Here we have an offre, or an offre. You can pronounce it two different ways. Um, this is Spanish. It's a beautiful velvet. We have these roundels with several saints identified in them. And um, this technique is called ornoué, which is very rare. It was only made in Florence. And it's, um, it's painted needlework. Again, in an illiterate society, this would tell a story to someone who couldn't read. Um, 
we have these beautiful um, arabesque motifs. Um, which are very stylistic of the period. And this is an applique technique also. This also has been dyed with Kermes dye, which is um, similar to the cochineal dyes, um, but it's even a little bit harder to find. So much more exquisite and beautiful. The condition of this is really remarkable considering it would have gone down the back of a, of a priest's uh, cope or dalmatic or chasuble. And um, I love this image that we found. Um, it's, it's El Greco. It's the burial of the Count of Orgaza. And here you'll see um, a near identical bit of this on the sleeve. So this, this would often, t there might have been another piece of this that would have been on the sleeves, but this clearly would have been down the length of it. But th I thought that was a nice, a very nice image. And this is from the uh, late 1500s. <laughs> What we have here is a very unique uh, chasuble uh, from the uh, late 1600s, early um, 18th century. It's Elizabethan embroidery. And um, I love it because there's a lot of symbolism in this piece, which is very rare for the 17th and 18th century because uh, people were becoming um, more literate. They could read more. They didn't need such blatant um, symbols. But so this is very rare. It's all gold. It hasn't tarnished very much. The colors are still so beautiful. And we'll ha we have a lion in here. We have um, the dove. We also have the peacock, um, which are all symbols in the Bible. And I love this because it's, it has this vine rinceau, which is this wavy um, motif, very symbolic of that period. And I believe it symbolized the tree of life. Um, when trying to match up the artwork, it became increasingly difficult in the 17th, 18th century because it, they didn't have a whole lot of ecclesiastic art. And so this was a time period of, of lightness and freshness and naturalism, rococo. I mean, the music was lighter. Everything was different. It changed so dramatically from the earlier periods. And so you'll see a gentleman here wearing a beautiful um, robe and vest and so forth as they did back then. And oftentimes they would donate their clothing to the church to be um, made into um, the, the church garments. Here we have a beautiful cope. This, again, tying into um, garment being donated to the church. This is a perfect example of it because if you'll see there's patchworks, the cutouts. It's not perfectly made for this cope. So therefore, made from a gown, a court gown, the size of this with the huge panniers. So there'd be a lot of fabric to work with. And this cope is very, very, very wide and very heavy. But I do think it's fascinating how this time period tells such a different story than the earlier time period where everything was made for the church. And this room here, you'll just see a lot of um, clothing that would donate to the church. And then they would make them into um, vestment. And this would be a court gown because of the gold. Um, only certain people could wear gold in their clothing. And usually those who would go to court to be presented to the king would have a gown as magnificent as this. This would not be an everyday gown of a wealthy woman. This would be something very, very special, maybe even a wedding dress. They didn't wear white wedding dresses back then. And um, all the gold is, is intact. It's very rare also because oftentimes these were taken apart and re repurposed. So I'm very happy with this piece. This is a beauty. This looks like a chasuble, which is what we saw in the others where the, what the priest would wear. And as one looks at the painting above it, one would think it clearly is a chasuble because it's very similar in coloration and in style. You have silver thread here. You have silver binding. That's real silver. Uh, that's not uh, any plastic thing that we have today. This is a French piece, which comes from the early 1700s. This is called a cloth of estate or a cloth of honor. 
generally someone of some nobility or someone with rank would have put this on their chair with a little, it would, it, it would be, create like a little canopy over their head so that you have a color that was very vibrant. Again, we talked about pomegranates earlier. This is a French stylized version of pomegranate right here. And you see the little fruit that's inside, which would have again symbolized when you chew on it, you well know pomegranates are that blood red. Again, it reminds us of vitality, of the blood of Christ being sacrificed for each of us. But I, always, I love the fact that we have almost the identical material here that we see in this painting. A friend of mine was looking at this who was an art major. She always said, you know, I always looked at paintings like that and saw these cloths and thought, oh, it's the fabrication of the artist's mind. Not so. It's a fabrication of the fabric <laughs> and of the, of the weaver of this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful cloth that comes from France. Again, yes, it's woven. It's much more, we're getting early, later on in the period of time where we can weave these things into the material much easier than they were able to when we were back in the 13 to 1500s. Now we have the beginnings of being able to do that. And it's stuff that they've learned from China. So a lot of the materials are actually oriental in color. You have a lot of the strong pastel colors here where you didn't have them in the older vestments. Much more stylized. It's not just pretty, pretty material, but now we're really looking at something that, that is very clear in its imagery. I love the blues. I love the coral. Coral, uh, the color coral or even little pieces of coral were used in religious times. Sometimes in the nativity scenes, you'll see Jesus has a, a ra baby rattle, but it's made out of coral. Coral warded off evil. Don't ask me why, it did. <laughs> it was one of those things that the culture tends to believe. So if you have something with coral color, you're protecting yourself from evil. It warded off. I guess the devil just didn't like coral, that's all. <laughs> I feel like Sister Wendy. <laughs> Stop. 